Good morning. This talk is about how femininity is represented in cinema. There are a number of formulations that we will consider, but the most important, the most primary one that I would like to um, uh, present is how films pass or do not pass the Bechdel test. The Bechdel test, named after Alison Bechdel, the famous uh, graphic novelist and uh, made by her with um, a partner Liz Wallace, is a formula that helps us to understand how women are represented in movies. So there are three elements to this formula. Bechdel says that a film should have more than one woman in a part of um, any significance that woman should talk to another woman in the course of the film and whatever conversation they have should be not about a man, should not be about something um, romantic for example or should not be about a man per se. So this sounds like a very simple thing, a very ordinary and mundane thing perhaps but surprisingly a lot of films do not uh, make the cut as far as uh, these three propositions are concerned. So, I will explore this concept through um, a few films. Some of them are mainstream Indian films, some of them are diasporic films but watched intensively in India, did well in the box office in India, etc. and which uh, are part of our cultural imagination. So, the, the, through this process I will be looking at how films create pleasure, Films create ideas about gender, gendering, about what the society's normative value systems are, etc. And we will be looking at, we will consider how uh, the, the films themselves are shot and how the mise-en-scene develops, etc. to produce these constructions for us. So the first film that I am going to consider is a very famous film, it is Bend It Like Beckham, which I am sure all of us have watched multiple times and we are pretty familiar with. So I'm going to consider this song in Bend It Like Beckham called Nuri, which is of course a song taken from the uh, much older 1970s Indian film called Nuri. So in uh, the original film, the first film, the song Nuri opens with this young girl walking through this panoramic Kashmiri vista and the natural uh, objects, the natural, the mise-en-scene that shows us the world behind her, the natural world behind her, is able to communicate to us Nuri's beauty, Nuri's innocence, her virginity and all the motifs in the song, the, her red outfit, the basket of, uh, the basket which contains a water pot that she's carrying, the, the river that, uh, the brook that gurgles through some of the frames, etc. All of them suggest that Nuri belongs in this world which is both beautiful and spontaneous and unspoiled. So the whole idea that you know femininity can be connected to beauty, to a presence which is unsullied, chaste etc. is established through this mise-en-scene and I am going to now consider how this mise-en-scene contrasts contrapuntally and intersectionally in how um, Bend It Like Beckham uses it. So Gurinder Chadda's Bend It Like Beckham uses this song Nuri as the non-diegetic sound in an instance where uh, the central character Jess has been forbidden from going and playing in her football match and she has to assist instead in um, wedding preparations in the house. So where the first Nuri, the older song Nuri had this beautiful backdrop of Kashmir and its mountains and its sense of freedom and clean air, what we have in Bend It Like Beckham is a mise-en-scene which is very crowded with household objects, with domesticity, with ideas of what it means to be in a normative uh, familial space where cultural values are already defined and where you cannot uh, reinvent or change things, etc. So the mise-en-scene in um, Bend It Like Beckham, where uh, the, the lyrics of the song, so the lyrics of the song, all of you are familiar with the, the words, it, it goes, uh, re, dil ki pyas bujhad, bujhade, etc. So in the ardor and the passion with which the female voice is singing and saying, come and quench my passion. 
that passion is 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 a heterosexualized um, romantic passion in the older film, but in the newer film and uh, the 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 uh, Gurinder Chadda's use of the song and montage in the song helps us to understand this. The ardor and the passion that the female voice, the female singing voice, is communicating is not for a romantic um, male objective desire, so much as it is for a whole um, collection of affect. So it's 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 this ardor for playing football. It's this ardor for being with her teammates. It is this ardor for exploring her relationship with the coach Joe, etc. So uh, when the song sings, when the when the background music plays, Dil ki pyaas bujha bujha ja, the the um, kind of things happening around Jess are all suggestive of um, entry into heteronormativity. So her sister is getting married, and the rituals around that marriage are depicted. We see a plastic mat in the green lawn that the sister's feet are placed on, a uh, chadar, a red dupatta is uh, held above her head by family members, turmeric is smeared on her face, etc. And all of these are gestures welcoming her into a life of uh, fertility and prosperity as a bride, etc. So the idea that one sister can have her um, her desires met, her passion, uh, her ardor quenched, and her passion, uh, her passion accepted, etc., contrasts very strongly with the other sister finding herself unable to exercise her passion. So, what we see is uh, Bend It Like Beckham is able to use a song like Nuri, which has its own history, its own trajectory as um, uh, as a very as as one of those profound songs that communicate romantic passion in Hindi cinema. So using that kind of song contrapuntally to make another kind of meaning, to suggest that heterosexuality is not the only place of fulfillment, that there can be things other than the romantic is, I think I would, I would argue, is one of the ways in which we can think of the, the Bechtel test over here. So we have a young woman who is the protagonist of the story and she is surrounded by people. She occasionally is seen talking to them, not just in the song but in the film and she is talking about things very much other than um, uh, boys or some kind of romantic relationship, etc. So what we see when uh, we hear this song play out is we see not the Kashmiri backdrop of course but we see a very cluttered uh, suburban household. The space of the lawn is taken over by people who are so close on one another and uh, the, the space is densely packed and there is very little room in which people can move without touching one another etc. And then the camera pans out to take in the garden next door which has a white woman hanging out the laundry. She is uh, she's completely you know uninterested in this uh, wedding or its rituals etc. She is going on about her life. So Dil Ki Pyaas whatever the, the anguish or the longings of the heart are, are very different for two neighbors as suggested when the camera moves from the close uh, focus shots of um, Jess's garden to the to include the rest of the suburb and the shot cuts out to the sky eventually. So what we see now is it's not Kashmir, it's not the idealized uh, romantic uh, fantasy heroine or the young woman heroine who is the cynosure of the male gaze that is being um, depicted here but it's a young woman who has dreams of playing football and who can't uh, play football in that particular occasion though the, the match is so important because uh, she has to be part of this ritual. So the, the song of longing where um, you long for heterosexual fulfillment here becomes a song of longing for fulfilling your own passion, your own dreams. So using contrapuntal sound, using um, non-diegetic, uh, using the song non-diegetically Bend It Like Beckham is able to actually give us um, a positive answer on the Bechtel test in this instance by showing us how the heroine speaks, how her subjectivity, her interiority are communicated through an older song, through, um, through not exactly dialogue but through being able to communicate as if uh, in a monologue or a, you know, a soliloquy as it were through this older song. So uh, you know when the when the 
uh, lyrics of the song talk about uh, uh, when dusk falls, literally dusk falls in uh, Bend It Like Beckham and it's evening in the yard and uh, she's, she's trying to dribble with a football but she's asked to make samosas instead and uh, where the lyrics of the song talk about uh, the fragrance of uh, the beloved the, the, the frame in Bend It Like Beckham shows us all these women sitting around the table including uh, Jess all of them sitting around the table and uh, filling samosas. So the, the uh, sense, sensory kind of imagination that this evokes, where the lyrics of the song suggest the, the, the pleasurable fragrance of the person that you're attracted to, what we have here is the, the smell communicated of domestic chores and the, the kind of bodies that are around her, the kind of people that are around her, one or two of them are shown to be desirously looking at Jess but she doesn't desire them back. And in the course of the, the song uh, playing out, the montage shows us her footballer teammates training. So we see how they exercise their bodies in a completely different way from how these people are exercising their bodies, how they're using, holding their uh, space, etc. So we see, uh, for example, uh, Jess's teammate Jules. Jules' uh, full name is Juliet, but the more androgynous or more masculine uh, shorter nickname is used for her. So Jules is training and so are other teammates. The coach Joe is trying to train somebody else to take Jess's position, etc. So the longing of the, the heroine, the protagonist, her song is, is about uh, her longing to be with them. And while they are playing or while they are training, they are also shown to be longing back for her. So in the, uh, the, the older version of Nuri, the unmixed version, the original if you will, the uh, two parties, the two protagonists in the song, the, the two people for whom the voiceover is done are uh, the uh, idealized heterosexual romantic couple. But here when you have only the female voice singing and you don't have a, a masculine reply voice, what's happening again is that the idea of whose story it is, who authors the story, who's going to be the primary narrator, that idea is actually crystallized to show us that this is Jess's story, this is Jess's script, etc. She's the one with the longing and she's the one doing the talking and even if there's nobody else dialoguing back with her, there's no closure on the heterosexual narrative. That itself is the goal of, um, uh, of, the, of the entire uh, sequence, the song sequence. So Bend It Like Beckham's song sequence works uh, using uh, a non-diegetic uh, sound track, but it takes the plot forward, unlike uh, how typically Hindi film songs would, uh, would work. They don't necessarily have to take the plot forward. But through this process of showing us how, um, how a romantic track can actually come to symbolize other desires, other goals, etc. What we have is uh, the fulfillment of some of the parameters of the Bechdel test. We have a woman, we have another woman in the plot or we have many women. In fact, the wedding is a very feminine space. Lots of women are doing lots of things. And um, they are actually thinking, this particular woman, Jess is thinking about something other than women. In a later scene in the film, when she talks about um, wanting to go to the USA because she's got a football scholarship, her mate, uh, another South Asian man, Tony, offers to tell her family that the two of them are engaged so that uh, she can go on this football scholarship, which um, her family doesn't want to go, what doesn't want to allow her to go on. So in uh, in that sequence, we see there's there's a lot of again the cluttered miso scene is very important. The insides of the house. This is just after uh, the the wedding is just uh, finished. Jess has managed to sneak out with her father's help to go play in the football match and come back. And she's wearing this very pink sari, which her uh, teammates, who are all of them, are non-South Asian. They're all um, other ethnicities than um, uh, than Asian, and many of them, most of them, are white. They clumsily but very endearingly tie the sari on her, and uh, somehow or the other make her presentable to come back home after the football match. So um, the 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 mise en scène in the scene where she she wants to 
say that she's got a football scholarship and she wants to go to the UK is it's both cluttered and it's also the, the, the pink in that scene where the, the, the pink of the outfit that she's wearing but at the same time her tan because she's been out in the sun playing football such a lot so she's not a conventionally uh, fair or non-athletic looking uh, South Asian girl. So the Miso Sen in this, uh, in this scene um, is able to bring our eyes to focus on how the female South Asian body would look if it were not conventionally feminized, it, if, it, if it were to have uh, meanings other than the conventional femininity in which the female body is only available to a male gaze. So what we can see then is instead of the dichotomy of the gaze always being um, on a woman and that gaze being by a male or by uh, the viewer occupying a male position, what we see is a kind of rethinking of the gaze pattern. So uh, we saw the conventional uh, yard of the household, but with the song Nuri speaking to a non-heterosexualized uh, uh, conception of passion, non-eroticized, hard to say non -ero non wrong to say non-eroticized, it's more like um, the eros is given a significance other than just uh, the heterosexual. So when we see the song being used like that, or when we see the, the body of the heroine clothed in a pink sari, it should make a conventional meaning, but her, 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 the way she wears the sari, the pink, etc. The miso sen therefore takes a completely different kind of meaning, because that body, the body that she has used as an athlete just now, is not just that, uh, it doesn't just have that one meaning as a body that is uh, available for um, male consumption or to the male gaze, etc. So we are, in a sense, able to uh, re-triangulate uh, Laura Mulvey's idea, perhaps. So we are able to see that the female body can do many things. The female body can be interested in things other than uh, being the sinosure of the male gaze or of male desire, etc. But Gurinder Chadda's film stops just short of making that body queer. So there are lots of um, gags in this film which suggest that these girls are constantly being identified as uh, homosexual by others because they play uh, football and football is identified with um, somehow not with um, heterosexual femininity. But at the same time, both uh, the actresses who play Jess and Jules, Jules is played by Kira Knightley, who's, uh, who's got a status as this very attractive uh, young actress who, who, who already had that cachet at the time of this film. So the idea of uh, making these very feminine uh, actresses play this very athletic, uh, athletic footballer role so the, the Gurinder Chadda is actually using um, their very conventional femininities to speak to very uh, non-heterosexual understandings of the female athlete's body. So in that sense, this film is a little bit timid. It doesn't want to use bodies which would be interpreted as androgynous or would not be immediately um, uh, admired for their femininity. So the film is very careful to use, therefore, very conventionally gendered feminine bodies or feminine bodies thought of as uh, sexually attractive in order to tell the story of sexual attractions which need not necessarily be heterosexual. So Gurinder Chadda wants to queer the whole narrative of what it means to be a South Asian diasporic person, but at the same time she also doesn't want to push the gender boundary too much. So here we have therefore this um, symbolization of the queer person as actually very feminine and attractive in the conventional sense. So next thing I'm going to talk about is um, another diasporic film, it's called uh, Chutney Popcorn. So uh, Chutney Popcorn is the story, very briefly, of um, a lesbian uh, South Asian uh, woman living in New York who has an American uh, girlfriend of Italian descent. Her mother doesn't accept the relationship and introduces uh, her girlfriend as her college roommate. The film opens with the two of them trying to attend her uh, sister's wedding. 
and uh, later on the sister discovers that uh, she is not able to conceive and therefore the protagonist, her name is Reena, offers to be the surrogate mother for her sister's um, child, so the, uh, uh, to conceive the child. So the story is actually um, pretty complex and pretty enmeshed in all kinds of um, questions about what does it mean to be feminine or what does it mean to be a lesbian in a South Asian um, uh, milieu, what does it mean to be um, an artist, Rina is somebody who um, does mehendi art on the bodies of women in a salon in uh, New York. So the film opens with, uh, the, the credits open with uh, Rina at work on the bodies of women. So here we have actually a very different kind of um, presentation of the female body. So Rina is this actress who is not, uh, not exactly uh, somebody who would fit into the conventional framework of feminine attractiveness and she, she presents as relatively uh, not so femme. So she is wearing for example uh, chunky shoes or overalls or uh, her hair is not styled in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that is thought of as uh, conventionally attractive for women or she's not wearing makeup, etc. So she would more or less fit into the presentation of what would be thought of as butch, very similar to how uh, the footballers in uh, Bend It Like Beckham are presented, but because they are played by conventionally attractive um, actresses, the, the disruption, the idea that the female body is um, not simply, you know, always um, playing up to the male gaze, that, that disruption happens uh, far more in Chutney Popcorn. So this um, uh, character, Reena, is drawing Mehendi designs on the bodies of women in, um, and these women are from different ethnicities, in a salon where they, where, where other beautification services are offered. But the way the film presents this, um, this process of beautification or this process of making art is, um, is striking and interesting. So the art is drawn on different parts of women's bodies. It can be on the knee or on the thigh or the arm or cleavage or any, any part at all. And the, the suggestion here is that Mehendi art isn't just a conventional form of adornment that women do for men. It's not a form of art that um, should be confined only to big festivities or to marriage rituals but it's actually an art form that can be accessed by women of all kinds of backgrounds and for their own pleasure. So the film shows us, for example, Rina's girlfriend agreeing to have Mehendi drawn all over her as an, um, as, as, as an instance of allowing herself to be uh, closer to Rina. It's, 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 it's something that is part of uh, their erotic engagement. So this idea that the female body is available to other feminine uh, persons and that the female body can have art drawn on it in different uh, places by another woman, which can also be, you know, an, um, an, uh, an erotic um, uh, act is suggested by the film right at the outset. So there's, um, there's a very clear cut disruption then of the idea that the feminine body is only available to male persons or no male persons in the scene at all. And once she's drawn uh, her designs and her designs are, uh, they are not exactly conventional designs, but they're also recognizable as the conventional uh, Mehendi art that uh, we would see. So uh, once she's drawn these designs, she Rina photographs them and uh, her photographs adorn her place of work. So the idea that Rina creates art, which is South Asian in origin, but at the same time, because Rina herself is South Asian, it's not appropriative in the same way as um, if a white person were to be creating it, is, is very clear. Rina, uh, it locates Rina as somebody who wants to be, um, who wants to be in contact with her South Asian roots, but at the same time innovate and uh, take them to places where they would not be acceptable in that format, would not be legible or visible in, in South Asian context. So the film um, plays upon this theme multiple times. So, you know, uh, Rina and her uh, mother are sitting in front of, um, uh, front of the river and on the other side of the river is the Statue of Liberty. And the mother says, oh, look, the Statue of Liberty is wearing a sari 
and Rina thinks, so, oh, wow, how is that even possible? She's, she's making, she's slightly, snidely looking at her mother, but the huge expanse of the water in front of them and the Statue of Liberty in the distance is the, is the mise en scene for a conversation that they have about, is it possible to be an out lesbian in India? But Rina suggests that perhaps uh, it's not necessary to be an out lesbian. You can still exist as a lesbian in different parts of the world, including South Asia. And maybe, you know, um, her grandmother was a lesbian, she suggests to her mother, and her mother finds that outrageously funny. But the interesting thing here in the mise en scene is that the conversation happens in an open public space, as many other conversations in this film. The conversations that happen in the open, so the Panwala overhears, for example, that um, Reena is going to bear the child for her sister Sarita and uh, her husband Mitch, so she's going to be the surrogate, is, is something that the Panwala overhears while he's making pan. And similar other, you know, he's perhaps the only person who knows about it, similar other conversations happen uh, that he's able to uh, hear. So effectively, what happens is the idea that um, a non-heterosexual person or a non-conventional formulation of family should be kept secret, should stay indoors or should um, not be known, etc., is explosively disrupted in this film through the use of uh, scenes that are set outdoors or which happen in the yards, in the gardens of um, different houses rather than inside. Or, you know, there's, a, there's another scene in this film where um, all these young women, they're all lesbian, they are standing in the street and uh, uh, they call it scoping out the dikes. So they're trying to see if there are other women in the street who are not heterosexual. And how do they pick this out? So they look at the shoes and the socks that the women are wearing and make conclusions. They assume that this woman is definitely a dyke. The, they use the word dyke in a positive sense. So uh, they, they, they say that this woman is definitely a lesbian or this woman is definitely not a dyke because no self-respecting dyke would wear uh, socks like that, etc. So the, what, what this kind of scene does, and this is a scene set in um, an ordinary uh, street, uh, perhaps in Jackson Heights, in an ordinary street where there are many ethnicities, but it's a recognizable street in New York. So the idea that even in the conventional big city, which is at the heart of um, capitalist modernity, etc., there are spaces for the non-heterosexual to exist, for non-heteronormativity to flourish, to thrive, etc., suggested in through the use of a variety of outdoor scenes and in uh, interior spaces like the one where Rina is making art on women's bodies do, using her me uh, Mehendi art. In these interior spaces too, there are subjectivities and there are relationships or clusters of people who are not heteronormative is amply suggested. So what we have then is the normalization as it were of queer bodies or queer ideas or uh, ways of being which are not necessarily um, heterosexualized. So Chutney Popcorn is able to actually uh, show us, to communicate to us that there are a variety of these solidarities and that there are varieties of ecosystems which allow these uh, women and these subjectivities to exist and to thrive also. So what we see then is a kind of um, framework for female existence which is not necessarily tied to connections with men and many kinds of uh, male persons do appear uh, in the course of the narrative, but uh, how these women negotiate with uh, the patriarchal claims that they make on their bodies or on their emotions, etc., is what the rest of the narrative is about. So um, these two films, I, I opened with them because uh, these two films are actively able to set in motion through the narrative and through the use of shots this idea that uh, women have lives or solidarities or communities outside of um, relationships with men, this is a significant thing because if we compare this with the average ecosystem in a lot of films, we find that uh, female subjectivity doesn't really get a lot of um, space. We find that it doesn't uh, get um, a certain kind of visual respect as it were. So that's what I will talk about in the next part of uh, this lecture.